God is a spirit, and those who worship him must do so in spirit and truth. John 4, verse 24. We come here to offer our praise and adoration unto God the Father. We come here to worship the King in the glory of his splendor and the beauty of his holiness, and we come to bow before him and to do only those things which are prescribed by his word to do. And we do this only with the proper motive and the proper intent. That is to worship God in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. What a privilege it is to be here. What a privilege I have to stand before you to preach the gospel of Christ. It is a privilege of which I truly am not worthy, but I'm so thankful for. What a blessing it is to be a member of the body of Christ. What a blessing it is to be able to break forth the bread of life and to do so faithfully, speaking only as the oracles of God. First Peter 4, verse 11. This morning, I'm going to challenge you, I think, with this lesson. I have mentioned something similar to this in the lesson previously, uh, but this is something that I think is going to get to uh, it's going to get to us. It's something that I think that we're going to be encouraged by, and it's going to challenge you. It's going to challenge you. Are you really offering to God what you should be offering? Aren't these the kind of lessons that we're supposed to be engaging in? Aren't these the kind of questions we're really supposed to be asking? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Is that not something we should be doing daily? I pray that if we find that we are lacking in some area, that we would correct that. That we repent of that, acknowledge that to God, and do our very best to do better. That's what we're expecting. Are we perfect and sinless? No, we're not. But we are to be faithful. And the faithful, when we realize that we are not as we ought to be, we should change. Mm -hmm. So, with those things in mind, and as usual, I would ask you to prove me. We're going to reference a lot of scripture. Follow along with me. See what we have on the board here. And make sure that what I am saying is what I'm supposed to be saying. Because in reality, as we would all say uh, in this congregation, as good and faithful as we are, uh, and the, the love that I have for each of you is evident, but we can't get each other, we can't get others, I can't get you to heaven by my will and my authority. The only thing that can get you there is this book. Mm -hmm. And that's our job is to speak this book faithfully. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're here to do. So please prove me. 1 John 4 verse 1 as we go through this study. The study is titled... Offer that which does cost me, cost me nothing? And that's a question. And it's going to be a study of sacrifice. Introduction. So often the world thinks of God and service to Him in a flippant manner. So many folks we see today that have the t-shirts, I love Jesus, or on Facebook, like or share if you love Jesus. Well, I don't need to like or share if I love Jesus, and I don't need the t-shirt. Because my life shows that I love Jesus. That is how it's supposed to be. So often the world thinks of this in a flippant and an irreverent manner. It ought not to be. We look at spiritual service and sacrifice, and I'm saying we, not us specifically, but mankind in general. Mankind in general looks at spiritual service and sacrifice as a trivial matter. Well, I'm going to go to church this morning, and I'm going to go there, and, and then I'm good for the week. That's kind of what people think. Uh, and I hope that you don't think that way. And if I do, I hope I step on your toes. Because I hope that after this lesson you don't think of this. Mm -hmm. Because that is not the way to think of this. Not worthy of our full attention and our best efforts. Think of what Brother Jerry mentioned just a moment ago. The perfect sacrifice. We think of his death sometimes, don't we? We think of the anguish. And rightfully so. But have you ever thought of every second, of every minute, of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, he lived was perfect. For you. He lived that life just so he could die for you. Not for his sins, for he had none, first Peter 1 19, but for ours. Brother Jerry said, We sent him to the cross. Amen. We did. My sins. Your sins. If not for our sins, he would not have had to die. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Should that have our full attention? Do I have your attention now? I think I've got your attention right now. Should it have our attention? It should. Mm -hmm. This attitude of flippant and irreverence is contrary to the humble attitude of approved persons we see in Scripture. This lesson will look at one example and make an application for us today. After all, we are made kings and priests unto our God. Revelation 5 and verse 10. What do priests do? They the text, 
2 Samuel chapter 24, this may be a little small, I apologize. I'll read it for you. 2 Samuel 24, beginning in verse 10. <coughs> Regarding his numbering of the children of Israel. And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the, God, of the Lord came unto him, uh, unto the prophet Gad, yeah, David seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee these three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come upon thee in the land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies, while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise, and see what answer I shall return unto him to send me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strength. Let us fall now to the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning, even unto the time appointed. And there died the people from Dan, even unto Beersheba, 70,000. <coughs> 70,000 died for David's sin. Continue. And David spoke unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thy hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came to that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear up an altar to the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on towards him. And Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Aruna said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? Then David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Aruna said unto the king, Let my lord take and offer what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for the burnt sacrifice, and threshing instruments, and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Aruna as the king, uh, as a king, give unto the king. And Aruna said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. Then the king said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord by God that which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor of the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. Then David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. Here we have the text. Here we have the principle. Aaron was going to give his king gladly give it to him to offer to the Lord. And David said not so. He would not dare offer that to God which cost him nothing. That is our thought for today. I'll emphasize this again in verse 24, and I'll read you the, the parallel account from the book of Chronicles. And the king said unto Aaron, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee in a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings, to, uh, burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which does cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor of the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. 1 Chronicles 21, 24. And the king said unto Ornan, Nay, but I will barely buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. So we have this principle in parallel accounts from 2 Samuel 24 and 1 Chronicles 21. Now let's think about something. Are we not blessed so greatly? Brother Lee sometimes mentions that those outside the body of Christ, that those who are living in this world today, every day that they have, they don't use to God's glory, but it's actually a day of mercy. And he's right. In 2 Peter 3, verse 9, we know that God is not slack concerning his promise, but he wants all to come to repentance. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, we know that the Lord wants all men to be saved by coming to a knowledge of the truth. He doesn't will for any to be lost. And just as you see in the accounts of Genesis chapter 15, regarding the Amorites and their iniquity and not yet being full, God was giving them time either to repent or to continue down their road to destruction. He was giving them time, and that's what he's giving the people today. We are a blessed people today. This nation is a blessed nation. But the children of God, the faithful, the body of Christ, are the most blessed people on all the planet, for there is nothing that compares to the blood of Christ. All of the gold, all of the silver, all of the diamonds of this world, if you were to put together all the precious metals and precious jewels that we treasure so greatly, if you were to put them all together and multiply them times a million, you would not have the worth of the blood of Christ. And why is that? Because the blood of Christ can purify souls. Mm -hmm. The blood of Christ can cleanse us of our sins and give us that eternal inheritance with God 
in heaven above, the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls, as Peter said. What can compare with that? What would you give in exchange for your soul? Not with an emphasis even on the physical things. The members of the body of Christ, the church of Christ, are the most blessed people on all the planet. And that's why we should be so evangelistic in our efforts to get others to enjoy these wonderful blessings that we do. Notice with me, Ephesians 1, 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Mm -hmm. Notice the blessings that the body of Christ enjoys. Folks, if you've never been baptized into Christ, you're not in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you have how many spiritual blessings? Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ? How many, how many spiritual blessings are enjoyed outside of Christ? None. Mm -hmm. We are a blessed people. God made a way for man to be saved from his own sins. Notice. But God committed his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Who's him? Jesus. We are saved from wrath through Christ. He made a way to save man from his own sin. Whose fault is it that man sinned? God's fault or man's fault? It's man's fault. It's our fault. If you don't get to heaven, it's your fault. If I don't get to heaven, it's my fault. It's not God's fault. When we sin, that is our fault. What did Jesus Christ come to do? Matthew 1, 21, He shall save His people from their sins. As John Baptist saw the Christ walking towards Him, He said these words, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The separation between God and man would be rendered. It would be taken away through the body of Christ. Colossians 1, 21-23. That isn't for all, but it's available to all. Hebrews chapter 2. Jesus came to earth as a man. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not. But a body hast thou prepared me. Hebrews 10 verse 5. I think about it every time I partake of the unleavened bread. The unleavened bread. This is his body. This is representative of his body. He left the glories of heaven. Philippians 2. He cannot not be on the quality with God. I think to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Philippians chapter 2. He willingly came to this earth and a body was prepared for him just in the end he could live perfectly and it be destroyed on the cross. If that's not power, I don't know what it is. He lived a perfect life for us and he died for us. All the truth that we can ever need has been revealed for us. There is no ongoing revelation contrary to what our liberal and our denominational friends teach. They, all that we need is been revealed for us all those years ago, 2 Timothy 3. We are complete through the Word of God, verses 16 and 17. We have all that we need in the life of God. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. We need nothing else. Mm -hmm. We've got it all. He gave us everything. I wonder if it would be a just God who only gave us a bit of peace and didn't reveal the, all, all the things that we need and expects us to actually live our lives in accordance to His will if we don't even know His will. That wouldn't be a just God. A just God revealed all that we need and now guess what? Are we not less far beyond what we deserve? Am I the only one that when I pray to God daily, I tell Him just how undeserving I truly am? I doubt that I'm the only one. Since we receive such wonderful blessings from God, even greater to those of David, who is in our text today, I wonder if the same principle should apply to us. Should we give to God that which cost us something? Or that which cost us nothing? Notice again what redemption costs. Sometimes it is baffling for me to understand. But then again, I do think about things and, and I realize that some may not have studied these things as in depth as I have. And I, I understand that. But there are some in this denominational world who think that the church has no value. 
Our Baptist friends will tell you that you don't have to be a member of the Baptist church to go to heaven because you are saved at the point of belief. And yet, baptism puts you in the Baptist church. So what they're actually implying is you don't need the Baptist church to get to heaven. I can't imagine someone thinking of the body of Christ in that way, but they do. They think of the church as simply somewhere to go and associate, but it has no power. Friends, you won't find anyone in Scripture saved outside of the church. I, I challenge you to find it for me. And I'll be right back there as soon as this lesson's over. And show me anyone that is going to be saved individually outside of the body of Christ. You're not going to find it. Then I'm going to tell you why. Because Jesus Christ died to purchase the church. Acts 20 and verse 28. Take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. That is the most precious institution on this planet. The church of Christ. Notice what God requires. Very good point made by Brother Jerry Wednesday night that I added into this lesson regarding what does he require? What did he ask of Abraham? Take a servant, one of your many servants, and offer him. No, no. Take thy son. Mm -hmm. Thy only son, whom thou lovest, and offer him on the mountain which I will tell thee. Isn't that what he said? Take one of your servants. Take one of your thousands of cows, Abraham, and this will no, no. Your only son. What does God require? Oh, he required that of Abraham, but he doesn't require by principle. Now, I'm not saying you have to sacrifice your son. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is the principle. What does he expect of you? Oh, he expected that of him, but he expects less of you. Is that, is that logical thinking? It's not. What does he expect of us? He expects the same thing, our best. Regarding spiritual service, Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or spiritual, as the American standard says, service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice the sacrifices that were offered. Think of the, uh, the, the temple in the Old Testament. Think of the stones that made up this temple. They were lifeless stones. Well, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 as a reference to the foreshadowed to us in the church. What makes up the church? Is this building the church? No, no, no. We are the church, and it is made of lively stones. Mm -hmm. It is made of stones that can actually offer their living lives. The very daily lives that they walk is in service to God. Thus, it is a spiritual, reasonable, daily sacrifice. Have you ever noticed that we don't have an altar? That's not an altar. The church of Christ only has one altar. And that was offered almost 2,000 years ago. That's Jesus Christ. We don't have an altar. Mm -hmm. So many churches claim that they have an altar. That's not an altar. We don't offer sacrifices on that. Our sacrifices are spiritual. When we sing, when we pray together, when we are studying together as we are now, when we partake of the Lord's Supper and we give back, we are sacrificing. But we can also do so outside of the assembly. Our very lives can be an offering to God. In service to Him. Yes, we have to work, but can't that glorify God? To do as unto God and not as unto men, being men's leaders? Can't we work heartily unto the Lord in all that we do and thereby glorify God? Can't we do everything that we can in service to Him? There's a difference between service and worship. I hope we understand that. All of life is not worship contrary to what many claim. But we can offer service in various ways. Is this not what God expects? Notice. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for or unto good works. God afore prepared that we should walk therein. Ephesians 2.10. Think about Isaiah chapter 6. You think about Isaiah holding the glory of God. And Isaiah thinking that he was about to die or that he was dead already. And he had the seraphim which came unto him with the coal which he had taken with his hands from, or with the tongs from off the altar and he touched his mouth with it. And said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips. Thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is forgiven me. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom shall I go for us? And what did Isaiah say? Here am I. Send me. Mm -hmm. He was assured of where he stood with God. He was forgiven, and he was to work. That's what we are to do. We obey the gospel of Christ. We're forgiven of all our trespasses. The old man is dead. We are walking in the light. We have constant access to that blood. We are to go to work for the Lord. Not to sit back and never do anything. Not to sit back and never crack open your Bible because it's not important except on Sunday. Not to do that. But to study 
How are you going to know what God expects of you unless you read this book? Are you going to let us tell you? What if we're wrong? Mm -hmm. This word's not wrong. Man can be wrong. And I would encourage you to study for yourself. Mm -hmm. We are his workmanship. And we must work. <clears throat> Is it not valuable to spend our time working for God? Can't we do this by evangelism, by teaching his word to the lost? Notice. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Before our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved of God, your election, how that our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, even as you know what manner of men you showed ourselves towards you for your sake, and you became imitators of us, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example unto all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Listen to this. For from you has sounded forth the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith to God's word is going forth, so that we need not to speak anything. Paul is praising them regarding their evangelism, their teaching of these individuals. The word of the Lord has gone forth unto you in all these regions, so that we don't even have to say a word. It's already been spoken. It's already been taught truthfully. It's already been exemplified in your actions. Is this not pleasing to God? How does God feel about the lost returning to Him? Remember the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15? And as the son was away and spent his life in righteous living, spent his wealth, and he made a plan to come back to the Lord, and as he did, and the Lord saw him, that's what it's about. Don't you understand that? That this is the nobleman and his son. That is speaking of God and us. And God saw this man returning unto him. What did he do? He ran out and fell on him and he kissed his neck. You are talking about jubilant. You are talking about excitement. You are talking about love displayed. God loves us. And when the lost return to him, doesn't that bring glory to him? Doesn't that bring happiness? Doesn't that bring excitement and joy? Notice this. I say unto you, that even so there shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine uh, righteous persons who need no repentance. One text says that there is joy in the presence of the angels. Who's in the presence of the angels? Deity. Deity rejoices when a sinner repents. Isn't that what they were doing in Thessalonica? Isn't that what we should do? Sounding forth the word of the Lord. Bringing glory to God by speaking to individuals. Now, I'm not talking about just going out and speaking to folks. I'm talking about speaking to them of the truth and doing so faithfully. Doesn't that bring glory to God when a sinner recognizes his condition and changes? I wonder if God's been glorified over the last couple of years of those who have obeyed the gospel, even here at Creekland. He has. And is there joy in the presence of the angels in heaven over one sinner that repents there? What could be better? What could we work towards that would be more beneficial than that? How does God feel about the faithful restoring the erring? Those brethren that have erred from the truth. How does he feel about us restoring them? My brethren, if any among you do err from the truth, and one convert him, notice that. When one errs from the truth, he has to be converted back. Let him know that he who converts a sinner, did you see that? When a brother errs from the truth, he's a sinner. Why? Because he's living in this constant sin. When a brother restores him from the truth, or let him know that he who converts a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall cover a multitude of sins. I wonder if that brings glory to God when someone who is in error comes back into truth. It does. Is it not worth our time to do this? To serve the Lord as we all? But it's difficult sometimes, isn't it? It gives us anxiety sometimes, doesn't it? Well, if I tell this person this, it's going to make me uncomfortable. Well, who cares? We've got to put God's will before our own. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus, as the song we just sang. Aren't we going to stand for the Lord? If we don't, who will? If we don't defend the truth, who will? If we don't go to our brethren that are erring, who will? If we don't correct error, who will? Whose job is it? It's our job. And don't you dare pawn it off on somebody else. It's our job. We better do it. This would be giving the Lord that which costs them. Why? Because it takes our time and efforts to do it. What about our time for study? How could we ever know the will of the Lord if we do not spend time studying His Word? Does anyone have any doubt that when Brother Lee stands up here in the morning, when Brother Jerry, a couple of weeks ago, when he hadn't been up with Brother Lee, is there any doubt that they didn't know what they were talking about? 
There's not one doubt. Why? Because they were prepared thoroughly. They had studied the text. They knew exactly what they were talking about. And as they sat up there, you couldn't, it wasn't a bluff, so to speak. Some folks stand up here and they'll tell you something, but they don't really know what they're talking about. You can usually find them out, can't you? But when you have people that are prepared, there's no doubt. Is that not beneficial? Is it not something that cost? Is it not something we should do? Take time to study God's word so that we know what it says? Do we not come in contact with individuals in this world that need that teaching? Who's going to give it to them if we don't? Wherefore be ye not unwise? Wherefore be ye not foolish? But understand what the will of the Lord is, Ephesians 5, 17. Do you know that it's foolish to not make the efforts to understand what God is saying? He's already spoken. It's all right here. It's all in one book. Folks, all we have to do is take it and study it. All we have to do is study it and apply it. Is it that difficult? It is when it conflicts with what we want, isn't it? What a shame. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing, the American standard says, handling the right the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Timothy was an inspired, first century Christian. Timothy had a spiritual gift. And yet he had to what? Study. But you don't have to, right? Right. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. Notice the result of study and proper teaching. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself partially to them. Can you all read this? Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. That thy property may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. That's the teaching. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. I wonder if that's important. I wonder if I would dare stand up here before you and, and have no study whatsoever regarding a topic. Why in the world would someone do that? Why would we do that? Does it not benefit others when we study and then we reveal these truths? Perhaps there are some things that are difficult, 2 Peter 3.16. And perhaps those learned brethren that we've looked to before, that have gone on before us, and they were diligent in their studies of the Greek language and various texts, and we look to some of the things that they wrote before, and it helps, them, it helps us understand as Nehemiah chapter 8. It gives the meaning. It gives the reading. It shows us what the text means, and very often we can see that. And can't we also benefit from that as we come together in the assembly? Perhaps there were some questions about Titus chapter 2 and verse 12 today. Perhaps some of those were excellent in Bible study. Why? Because we spoke about these things. We, we have studied these things. Does it not benefit ourselves and those that hear us? When someone studies the truth, it does. Mm -hmm. Do we give ourselves wholly to spiritual things? I imagine a really honest assessment would be no. But isn't it something we should strive for? What is a very important thing? That, folks, this doesn't mean we can't go have jobs and we can't have a life. We are to have a life. We are to live on this earth. We are to live amongst, uh, amongst these folks. We have to. We have to do certain things. But our driving force, the thing that should be on our mind, the thing we speak about when we're walking along the way, the thing we speak about when we go and eat together, what are we talking about? Spiritual things. What is ever on our minds? Spiritual things. What, is, what are all that we're doing physically accomplishing? It's still accomplishing service to God. You can glorify God by working and doing what you're supposed to be doing a good job for your employer. You can glorify God by being a godly employer. There are various ways that we can do these things, that we should be doing these things. But our, our mind should ever be on spiritual things. Wouldn't this cause our property to appear to all? Someone who knows what they're talking about in the Bible, and they stand before you and they preach a lesson, most of the time you recognize that. And most of the time you would say, well, this individual's intense study of this has led to him knowing what he's talking about, and this actually helped me because I didn't realize this. Wouldn't that be profitable unto all? Sure. Mm -hmm. Our time for assembling and edifying one another. What about that? Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful to the promise. And let us consider one another to, uh, to excuse me, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Those Hebrew Christians, those individuals that had obeyed the gospel and were being influenced by Judaism, were told that the day of Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem is coming. This is the day that's approaching. That this intense persecution is going to come. And in light of this, you better not forsake the assembling of yourself together. They were looking at terrible things about to happen. What's our excuse? Well, I'm just too busy. Well, I'm, I've, I've got this going on. Or I've got this. Well, it's the only time I get the chance to go race. Or it's the only time I get the chance to go play golf on Sunday. I don't want to tell you, except that you're training your soul for whatever you're doing. 
Where could you be possibly that would be better than right here? Where could you be, what could you be doing that's more beneficial than studying God's word and edifying one another and assembling and worshiping the God of heaven? Can you imagine being in fellowship with God and offering these things as a spiritual sacrifice? What would you rather be doing? Because you're tired to afford it for God. The saints in the first century met very often daily. Did you know that? Very often they met daily. You look through the New Testament, the book of Acts, and you see the, the time that they put in was daily. That doesn't mean that they partook of the Lord's Supper daily. Don't get me wrong. They only did that on the first day of the week. But they met and they talked and they evangelized and they disputed and they debated. They did these things daily. And yet, we can't make it three times a week. Well, that's asking an awful lot. No, it's not. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Christ. Acts 5.42. These were more noble than those of Thessalonica, speaking of the Bereans, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures every once in a while to see whether these things are true. Is that what it said? They searched the scriptures daily. You know what that means? That means that they were hearing it daily. Heard it daily, checked the scriptures daily. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Paul's our example. Are we disputing daily? Are we talking daily? Well, I don't have time for that. You should make time. Is our time far too valuable to offer to the Lord? I mentioned this Wednesday night. The Lord spent more time on the cross than we do in the assemblies in a week. You realize that? Six hours. He was six hours on the cross. He was three hours. No, he wasn't. He was six hours on the cross. Read it again. Mark 15, 25. Mark 15, verse 34. From the third hour to the ninth hour. How many hours is that? Six hours. Six hours on the cross. He spent more time pulling up on impaled wrists and pushing up on impaled feet just to breathe than we spend in this assembly in a week. And yet some of us can't even do it. I'm not talking about individuals who aren't physically able to. I hope I, you guys understand that. That is not what I'm saying. Someone who is sick, we're talking about someone who willingly chooses not to be here to do something else. That's what we're talking about. Not to mention the agony of Gethsemane, Luke 22. What about the hours that led up to this, that led up to the arrest? He was in agony in the garden, Luke 22, 44. What about the anxiety of knowing what he was about to suffer? Have you ever not looked forward to something? Have you ever dreaded something happening in your life? Imagine that, knowing that you're about to be beaten to death. You're about to die. And these folks are going to be merciless, and they're going to strip you down, and they're going to mock you, and make fun of you, and they're going to spit on you, and you create. Think about that. How would that be? I wonder if we're really seeking first his kingdom, if we're not giving that which cost regarding our time and our service. What about our efforts to shine? We teach others, not only in word, but in example. And by this I mean our time should be spent not in what we think God wants us to do, but in what He has already revealed for us to do. In His Word. That is to evangelize the lost. That is to preach the pure gospel, not what you think. That is in helping those in need. Yes, we should be doing that. That is in edifying the saved. Yes, we should be doing that. That is in being a good example to others. Someone's in need, you help them, if possible. Do we truly offer our best in this regard? Are we really exemplifying our understanding of truth? And our motive of love. Did you hear that? Motive is love. And the understanding is truth. And we should exemplify that in word and in deed. Ephesians 4.15. Mm -hmm. Do our lives truly shine before others? Matthew 5.16. Do we really reflect the glory of God in our actions? John 14 and verse 9. In this life we are mere stewards of all that we have. Notice this. Moreover it is required in stewards that a man be found. What? Do you really think that what you've got today, you've got by your own strength and power? Oh, it's all mine, mine, mine. There's no doubt that many folks have earned what they have. But we're talking about that all good, wonderful things come from above, James 117. And you are a steward of whatever you have. And as a steward, you better be faithful. Are we proper stewards regarding our talents? Some of us are very talented in some areas. Me, not so much as others. But we all have talents in some regard. Are we using those? 
Oh, I'm, a good, I'm, I'm pretty good at golf, so I'm going to go glorify God in golf. Folks, that is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about reflecting, I'm talking about bringing glory to God by our actions in our spiritual service to God. I'm talking about glorifying God by being a good employee, a godly Christian employee, by being a good employer, by being a good citizen, by helping those in need, but mainly and most importantly, by teaching the truth and never compromising nor never wavering. I want you to think about something. In Matthew 25, in verse 25 and 26, it says this. And I was afraid, and I went and hid my, uh, thy talent in the earth, regarding the parable of the talents. And lo, thou hast that as thine. And the Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have strawed not. The only reason that we read over this text, that this individual who took the talent and hid it, do we recognize the spiritual implications of this talent? Okay. He took this talent and hid it, and what was he called? Wicked. There's no other reason given than the fact that he hid his talent. He did nothing with it. Are you doing nothing with yours? Am I doing nothing with mine? We better ask ourselves. Are, are we using what God has blessed us to serve him? Obviously, in accordance to his own will. That doesn't mean I'm pretty good at the guitar, so I'm going to play guitar for Jesus. No, it doesn't. That doesn't mean that I'm going to I'm a woman and I'm a really good uh, speaker, but I'm going to preach. No, it doesn't. But you can still glorify God in your actions in other ways. Women can certainly teach in certain situations, and of course that's what you should do. We're also stewards of God's money. Do we really think that we have what we do by our efforts and power alone? Every good thing in this life is from above. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above. And going down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. All we have is from God that is good. Are we giving back as we prosper? We just gave back a few minutes ago, didn't we? We offered sacrifice by writing out a check from the money that we have in our daily lives. We wrote out a check or put cash in that we could spend otherwise, but we are sacrificing that for the service of the church. That's what we're doing. What did we give? Have we give? Are we giving as we've been prospered? Do you know what prosper means? Prosperous business in financial dealings, things of this nature. That's what the word means. Paul told those in court to give as they have been prospered. There is no tithing under the first, the New Testament church. You won't find it in the New Testament. We, we give back as we've been prospered. Perhaps we've only been prospered and we feel it's right to get 10%. Okay, that's, that's your decision. Perhaps we decide to get more. Prosper. Successful regarding businesses affairs. They are in strongs. That's what they listed as. To prosper. Where does that come from? As God has prospered us. What do we give to him? Do we give him the leftovers? Or do we truly give him something that sacrifices? Are we truly giving him something that is of value? God has blessed us with so much more than we deserve. So much more than we can ever give back. But we better recognize that all that we have is from Him, and we should glorify Him with all that we can. Mm -hmm. All that He has blessed us with, and according to His will, we should bring glory and honor to Him. To give back to Him that which has already died. Yet as this principle makes clear, we ought to give back to God that which costs. We ought never to give back to God that which costs nothing, but to give to Him that which costs something. Our service our time, our undying efforts to teach the lost and to shine as examples, our efforts in study, and we ought to give proportionately as he has prospered us financially. After all, we're only giving back to him that which is already his. Mm -hmm. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. Perhaps it's the case that you here among us, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, if you're not in Christ and you have no spiritual blessings, this is not an opinion, and I've shown that to be a scripture. This is what the Bible teaches I will offer you this invitation to hear the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17, that is how faith is produced. Upon your faith being produced, you should recognize that it is truth. You should, you should believe it. Uh, John 6, 29, you should repent of your sin. You should recognize your poor spiritual condition. Matthew 5, 3, repent. Change your mind about what you've been doing and change your actions. That is repentance and the fruits thereof. Acts 17 verse 30. Confess Christ before men. Matthew 10, 32. Be baptized for the remission of sins. This baptism is what puts you in the body of Christ where his blood flows. And that's where you're forgiven of sin and added to the church. Never before, and this is baptism on his authority, 
for the remission of sin. Be faithful unto the end, walking in his light, and we have wonderful hope. Romans 8, 28 through 29. For those who have obeyed the gospel, perhaps uh, something in this lesson has made you think about something. Perhaps something needs to be acknowledged to God. Uh, if it's a private matter, acknowledge it to God. If it's only known between you and him, acknowledge it to him. Repent of that, and he will forgive you. You are assured of that. And if you sin in some public manner, or if you brought a reproach upon the church, we'll pray with you, we'll pray for you, and we know surely that God will forgive you. 1 John 5, 16. That is why we're here, is to help one another, to learn, and to glorify God in all that we do. So if you have something in your life that needs to be made right, if you're already a member of the body of Christ, repent of that sin. And if you need the prayers of the church, or if you have any need whatsoever, we beseech you therefore on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God right now as we stand. There's a fountain.